tells us that we're making huge judgments about people that have nothing to do with their you know, actual performance on the job or their history or anything, um, just based on the way that they look. And body language is a similar kind of thing. And then we get into this idea of internal voices, which I feel like that's the thing that we actually really have control over. The other stuff, us reading each other's faces, we can be aware of it, but you can't actually really stop that from happening. Um, so your inner voice can be everything from, you know, that you're worried that I'm giving this presentation today, everybody's gonna think I'm dumb, or they're gonna think these ideas are wrong. Um, you know, and then you get into a tricky conversation with somebody and you don't get along with it, and you start thinking about all the things you don't like about them and how they're doing those things in that moment while you're there with them and how frustrating that is. You can think about how somebody's making off, you know, color jokes that you don't like or they're not being sensitive to the information you shared with them before. All of these things are voices that are speaking to you, that are taking you away from what that person is telling you. Um, and, you know, this really runs the gamut. So, like, it, it could be things, you know, even about your life about like the list, you know, you haven't done the laundry in a week, and like here you are listening to this person, and you really should have stayed home Saturday morning, you gotta get your laundry done. These are all, that they all contribute to our ability to actually hear what the person is saying. Um, so I kind of like this, this study because it really just illustrates the point of how uncomfortable we are with silence. Um, and part of listening is really giving people space to speak, and giving space often means being silent. Um, so Timothy Wilson is this famous um, psychologist who did these shock tests on people. And he basically first put people in a room and asked them to sort of just, you know, hang out by themselves. And then afterwards, he asked them questions about how that experience was and would they have preferred to be doing something else. And he was shocked at how many people hated being by themselves. And so then he did it again, and he offered people the ability to shock themselves as something to do rather than just being stuck with their feelings. And all of the people who got in, who agreed to the study, had also said prior that they would pay money to not be shocked, right? So we were going to be not a people that wants to be shocked, right? Um, and 67% of men and 25% of women chose to shock themselves rather than sitting with their own thoughts. So that, I mean, that really tells us a lot about our own sense of um, sense of self and also willingness to just sort of sit and be quiet for a little while. So, I mean, women performed better on this, but it's still fascinating to me. Um, so I like to say that our internal voices really drown out opportunities and that learning to listen creates openings and it really establishes you as a leader. And I think this is something that sort of is worth exploring. I think a lot of self-awareness is needed in order to be a good listener because you have to be aware of all of these sort of triggers you have and, and things that drive you off course. But I also think that we live in a world where it's, it feels a little bit, especially with our president right now, maybe that like the loudest voice is the voice that wins. But that's actually really not true. If you look at the data, it's much more that when, when people feel like they're being listened to, their blood pressure drops, they have all of these really positive um, experiences that happen and that connect them to the other person. And if you talk to people who are world leaders or CEOs of companies, one of the things that you really see across the board is they are phenomenal listeners. And they pick up on information and they're able to give it back to you in a way that really makes you feel significant. It makes you feel invested in them. It makes you feel loyal. All of these wonderful traits. They're not doing that by telling you anything. They're doing that by listening to you. Um, so, and then, you know, it also allows you to make sure that you have the right data. A lot of times we're walking around with bad data because we've made assumptions about things that are wrong. And so being able to learn to be a really good listener allows you to correct yourself and grow as you go. Um, Sorry. No problem. So I also, I like to point out that there's a, there's a big difference between being subservient and being an engaged listener. So the, the sort of tricks that I'm going to get to in this presentation are all about being a really, like say, active listener. That's another way of saying this. But you don't have to agree with anything the speaker is saying. It's not about saying, like, oh, yes, I love that idea. That's not it at all. It's just letting the person know that you hear what they're saying. You understand what they're saying. And then from that point, that's the opportunity to say why you don't agree, right? 
And I think as women, we need to be really careful of this because I think women are often put in these subservient roles without even realizing it. It's almost like a comfort spot that we get put in and that we tend to migrate towards. And so I told some friends of mine that I was coming back to Smith and I was going to give this talk on learning to be quiet. And they were like, oh, I got that one over really well, right? And I'm like, well, you know, it's interesting because I don't, I don't equate being quiet with being subservient at all. I equate it with being respectful and trying to understand and move the conversation forward. So I'm definitely not telling anybody to sit back and be quiet. I'm telling you to learn to listen, right? And that, that's sort of an important difference, which we can certainly talk about. Um, so then this is sort of like using your female brain to your advantage, since we're neurologically designed to be better listeners, which we've sort of gotten into a little bit here. Um, and we're biologically better at identifying other people's emotional states, then why have we viewed this as a negative for so long? It doesn't seem negative at all. It seems like something men spend a lot of time trying to work on, and we have this natural ability, and yet we're constantly worried that we're too emotional, right? Or, you know, women are put in these situations and they can't handle it because of their, emotion, their emotional intelligence. Like, this is ridiculous. We're totally looking at this the wrong way. Um, most negotiations are not at all about what the deal is on the table. They're much, much more about what the parties sort of have as an internal motivation or a sense of feeling validated or a way of you know, moving the company forward in a direction that indirectly sort of benefits them or their other people, um, other people or their wives. It's the same in family dynamics. And so I sort of feel like if we assume that all of these interactions are emotional, then saying women are emotional is a huge positive, right? That's not a negative at all. It's something that everybody should want to be more of. Um, and then there's this idea that like, you know, men always dominate the conversation and I can't get a word in edgewise and it's not fair, nobody ever listens to me. And anybody who's ever listened to sports radio, which I caught a little bit of on the way down here, it is phenomenal how nobody is listening to each other. So when you're in those situations where you feel like all of these men, women, whatever, are talking, and you're not getting a word in, don't worry, because they're not listening to each other at all. So you're not missing out on any piece of that. If you can actually be the active listener who follows up with the good questions and shows people that you're really listening, all of a sudden the floor will be yours and people will actually want to hear what you have to say. And that is like a, a dynamite trick that is hard to implement because we have this sort of competitive, competitive sensibility when we're in those situations where we feel like no one's listening to me. But actually, if you sit back and you show that you're the listener, you can totally flip the table on everybody. Um, okay, so how can you be a good listener? The research suggests that there are basically three basic things that you have to do so that people feel like you are listening to them and you hear them and you understand them. The first one is just simply repeating back in a way what they had said to you, right? That allows them to know that you understood them, that you got the data right, and that you're, you're there with them in this process, in the conversation. Asking a good question is the second most important thing. Actually, these aren't in any kind of error because this is the second thing to do. Um, and that also shows people that you're listening and that you're interested and that you want to know more. And that wanting to know more is important because the third thing is this idea of developing empathy. And I think, in my personal experience, or anecdotally, I would say that asking the question, a really good question, shows that you're listening. It shows that you've got the data right, and it shows that you think there's something about this person or this idea that's interesting. And by doing that, you ignite something in them that makes them feel important and also want to collaborate with. Um, and sometimes that 